continues to be Tewa land, something to keep in mind as we listen to our speaker. Thank you all for being part of this evening's webinar, What's My Legacy? Chicana O Literature and Culture in the American Southwest, which has been made possible by the Santa Fe Public Library and the Friends of the Santa Fe Public Library. Our speaker tonight is Dr. Vanessa Fonseca Chavez. Dr. Fonseca Chavez is from Grants, New Mexico. She received her MA in Hispanic Studies from the University of New Mexico and her PhD in Spanish Cultural Studies from Arizona State University. She is an assistant professor of English at ASU where she teaches undergraduate courses on Chicana O literature, indigenous literature and Southwest literature and film, as well as graduate courses in the MA in Narrative Studies program. She co-directs the following the Manito Trail project with Levi Romero and recently co-edited co -edited with Levi Romero and Spencer Herrera, the anthology Cadencia Reflections on the New Mexico Homeland, which we do have at the library and I encourage everyone to read. This evening, Dr. Fonseca Chavez invites everyone to ponder individual and collective legacies as she discusses her recently published book, Colonial Legacies in Chicano o Literature and Culture, Looking Through the Kaleidoscope. It is a book that challenges readers to reflect on the fragmented and peripheral narratives of colonial legacies that offer more complex understandings of individual and collective subjectivities, a timely topic for us here in uh, Santa Fe. After Dr. Fonseca Chavez's talk, the audience is invited to ask questions. If you have a question, please send it through the chat box or the Q&A box. We'll get to as many as we can. And thank you. With that, I'll turn it over to Dr. Fonseca Chavez. All right. Uh, thank you so much, Elena, for that introduction, and especially to the Santa Fe Public Library for extending the invitation to do this talk tonight. Um, I hope we can use this space tonight as sort of a virtual Resolana space uh, to think about uh, topics that have permeated local and national news for the last few years, uh, namely that of monuments and memory and the ways in which we celebrate and or negate colonial legacies of the past. Uh, particularly those that are tied to uh, colonial endeavors. So these conversations are central to my book, as Elena mentioned, uh, Colonial Legacies in Chicana and Chicano Literature and Culture, uh, which came out in October with the University of Arizona Press. And I believe you'll receive an email after this with a 30% discount code for the book if you uh, wish to buy it and read more. So I mentioned to Dr. Valdez that this is my first official book talk. So I'm really excited about that and also to end the year in this sort of virtual community um, I feel very close to Santa Fe, of course, having uh, grown up in Grants, New Mexico, and then lived for about eight years in a rancho, which is near Puaque. So I hope that the, the conversation today will uh, be of particular interest to you as Nuevo Mexicanos and as people who have uh, been very involved in conversations, uh, potentially conflictive conversations, again, in recent years about uh, monuments and memory. So I'm going to go ahead and start by uh, sharing my screen. All right, and so um, we already talked about the title of my talk, so I'm going to skip this, uh, this slide right here. Um, so I want to start by just saying that I'm not going to be able to have time to talk about the entire book project, but I just kind of wanted to lay out the chapters here so you get a sense of what was included in this larger conversation about colonial legacies. And so chapter one and two is what I'll be talking mostly about today because they deal uh, specifically with New Mexico um, and some about Texas. But chapter one, The Sins of Our Fathers, really centers on the colonial legacies of Juan de Oñate and the way in which uh, those legacies are played out within pageant spaces, monument spaces. You know, again, we're all very familiar with those topics here. Um, chapter two, Claiming a Home and Heritage, deals with um, the backgrounds of two um, socially elite Hispanas who wrote about uh, folklore and the preservation of Spanish and Mexican heritage in the early 1900s and the ways that sort of they imagined their own subjectivity as we shifted from the Spanish colonial period to the US colonial period, uh, starting in 1848 with the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo. In chapter three, I move us to think a little bit about um, a, a work of historical fiction by Emma Perez uh, called Forgetting the Alamo or Blood Memory. So this centers a queer vaquera in the 19th century borderlands in Texas, uh, specifically at the time of the Battle of the Alamo and the Battle of San Jacinto, and the ways in which uh, marginalized characters are written back into the historical narrative. 
Chapter four moves us to think about the different kind of colonial violence as it enacted uh, in the borderlands, particularly in Arizona within the Sonoran Desert. And uh, finally, the epilogue uh, moves us to think a little bit about uh, what does it mean to think about our legacy as a discontinuous continuity, um, a phrase that Genaro Padilla, Chicano scholar from New Mexico, utilized to talk about the complex nature of autobiographies like Jaramillo's um, in the early uh, 1900s. So, um, so I begin this presentation with a quote from Emma Perez's novel, Forgetting the Alamo or Blood Memory, in which the main character, Micaela Campos says, quote, the next generation would take on the weight of a past begun long before we were born and that weight endured into the next generation. Who would pick it up, measure it and say to each other, these are all lies. Where's my real legacy? In many ways, my path to writing this book stemmed from my own interest in both individual and communal legacies in the Southwest United States, as well as the moments in history when marginalized communities called out all of these lies. When Micaela's character, um, she's situated in the 19th century Texas borderlands in the time, like I said, leading up to the Battle of the Alamo and the Battle of San Jacinto, I looked instead to Northwestern New Mexico, to Kansas, California, and Mexico to learn, more, to learn more about my own family histories and stories in an effort to better understand and to articulate what I came to see as a legacy that at best is just really complicated. There are no easy answers to the questions of what one's real legacy is, but the tensions that arise as a result of these busquedas or searches is what I had hoped to untangle in my book. So I began this book thinking about my grandmother, my Nana and her home village of Atarque, located in Northwestern New Mexico. It was established in the late 1800s by Hispano families who were migrating from a much more populated central New Mexico. She didn't speak of Atarque often to us. Instead, the Senior Citizen Center in Gallup, New Mexico served as a meeting space or a resolana space for Los Atarqueños to talk about the memories of the communities that lived there until about the 1960s, when the last family moved. My Nana seemed to have a sense of the racial conflicts that ultimately resulted in yet another community migration during that time. This time they went to Gallup or west over the newly formed Arizona, New Mexico state border. They felt as though their culture and their physical selves were pushed out of their home village. I interviewed my Nana in 2006 and I asked her, where these newcomers came from. And she said, pues eran gringos de Texas. I guess they were going to California and they got lost, so they stayed. They never did learn how to speak Spanish. These Anglo-Americans, some who fled the Dust Bowl region and others who came from Texas, benefited from US policies of land expansion and settlement. They also brought with them, unfortunately, a disdain for los Mexicanos the same disdain that Emma Perez writes against in Forgetting the Alamo or Blood Memory. As a work of historical fiction, Perez inserts characters and voices that are forgotten or those that have been erased as a result of the colonial practices brought forth by the US in the mid 19th century. One of the characters, Lucius, a black slave whose wife was violated and slaughtered by Anglo-Texans says to Micaela, quote, look here, you better wake up to what's coming you might as well get yourself on back to Mexico and leave this place to old whitey because darling, it's slave lynching country and it's Mexican killing country and it's Indian scalping country and it's gonna be that way for a mighty long time." End quote. Of course, it's important to recognize that colonial ventures unfolded quite differently in Texas than in the New Mexico territory in the 19th century. But the assertion that one must quote, wake up to what's coming is a startling one. So Atarque, like many villages, um, Hispano and Hispano villages throughout New Mexico, did their best to survive the hardships, the violence, and the looming changes they endured in the face of Anglo-American colonization. They held on to memories and histories of Atarque, which are best understood through snippets of information that have been shared by the descendants of the original Atarqueños, of which there are very few left. This is part of the legacy that I inherit. A carefully preserved newspaper clipping, an oral history, a gathering at a community center, and other sources of embodied memory that helped me to comprehend and piece together 
the essence of a community during varied attempts at cultural erasure. Though it was clear to see the ways in which my family was threatened by US colonialism, I also had to confront their complacencies as descendants of Spanish colonialism and the colonizer slash colonized identity that characterizes Chicana and Chicano communities in the Southwest. I began to think more about these dualities, these multi-layered and fragmented pieces of who we are, how much we know about the world around us and how, much the, how those pieces might fit together or not fit together. How we view our individual histories and stories is complicated, as I said, uh, because we're often tasked to think about what the sum of those pieces mean and put them together in ways that result in different meanings over time. There's no doubt that these fragments matter. Without them, we don't understand our lives in the same way. But what happens if we learn something unexpected or if we take pause to think about things from a different perspective? In this book, I place my family, or my family story rather, in conversation with Chicana and Chicano and indigenous texts and cultural materials that I felt could offer an understanding of the complexities of colonial relationships in the Southwest. And I also know that a different configuration of texts might yield a similar result, but take a different path to get there. These materials reveal the presence of various characters associated with different historical eras and they register two or more residual discourses rooted in colonial practices. Though Chicana and Chicana literature was first made available as an academic field of study in the late 60s and early 70s, it later came to include archival and literary materials that were produced during the Spanish colonial period beginning in the 16th century. Because the American Southwest experienced at least two colonial periods, Chicana and Chicano literary scholars found it difficult to think about which fragments best encapsulated the experiences of Chicano and Chicano communities that had long-standing ties to the Southwest United States, but whose cultural heritage was tied to multiple nations through colonialism, including Spain, Mexico, and the United States. I use the image of the kaleidoscope in my book to understand how colonial legacies contend with intersectional issues of race, class, gender, and other categories to comprehend how different historical moments and political urgencies have ruptured or shifted the ways we think about our individual and collective subjectivities. So I went out and I bought this kaleidoscope here um, and I sat with it for a while thinking about the potentially infinite number of configurations that could be produced. Our lives and selves can be envisioned as a type of kaleidoscope where at least two mirrors, two selves, reflect one another and give us glimpses into the many ways in which the fragmented pieces come together through projected prisms. Kaleidoscopes make visible and possibly even more beautiful the different fragments that come together through a particular image. The jarring process means that these shifts are imperfect and difficult, though the end result, even temporarily, is a new image that we've never seen before and one that we may never be able to replicate again. But we can take pause with each configuration, reflecting on the fragments that did come together and what other possibilities may be before we once again shift and move into new configurations. Now, if we look at the kaleidoscope as a metaphor, an opportunity to visualize the images or ideologies of the fragmented pieces it contains, we can also think about the conditions that have produced particular limitations. For example, a welded area can optimize our view of the prisms that are reflected, something a pore lit area simply can't offer. Some fragments may be transparent, making them hard to see at all, though they're pivotal to the configuration of the image. By glossing over these, we miss key pieces of our histories and our stories. Each piece in the kaleidoscope has a potential to be seen in numerous ways, if we are willing to look beyond our own ideologies or perspectives. The kaleidoscope doesn't favor or even insist on being static. It encourages movement and contemplation, always towards something new and revelatory. The constant shifting and disrupting is what I've encouraged through this book project. So if Chicana and Chicano literature incorporates the complex and traumatic relations of colonialism forged over time, and these elements are fragments of a larger kaleidoscope where careful attention is given to intersectional concerns, how then does it engage with the fragments in a way that discourages complicity and complacency? And how do we expose the contradictions and contentions of our jaded pasts? <laughs>
So Chicana scholar Emma Perez uses the kaleidoscope image to refer to the fragmented pieces of colonial identities produced by a myriad forms of violence. She notes that a decolonial imaginary is possible, quote, where kaleidoscopic identities are burst open and where the colonial self and the colonized other become elements of multiple mobile categoric identities. While the legacies of Chicana and Chicano literature simultaneously inform and challenge colonial constructs, the kaleidoscope makes visible the rupturing of these fragments again and again via political and social urgencies. The prisms of the kaleidoscope cannot be merely two dimensional because they represent, as Pettis noted, many mobile identities. These colonial constructs represent a type of durability within Chicana and Chicano literature that we must rupture. Chicana and Chicano scholars must remain vigilant about what is produced, for whom, and for what purpose. My book builds on this idea precisely because it's imperative to acknowledge layered colonial relationships and to understand how colonial thinking impacts race, gender, and class within the kaleidoscope. As a Chicana from New Mexico, I understand how complicated it is to come to terms with our colonial past, to recognize that I am both colonizer and colonized and everything in between. Even if I don't have all the fragments at my disposal to fully understand what that means through different moments in my history and that of my family. Though I'm a proud Novo Mexicana, I also acknowledge that my more recent history is tied to Arizona, where my grandfather was born and where he and his father worked as copper miners until he was called to serve in World War II. When he returned, he faced what many other Mexicanos faced in the US, rampant race-based discrimination that didn't allow him to eat, for example, at a diner counter with his Anglo friends. No Mexicans, no dogs. I'm aware of the ways in which the copper mining and military industries have exploited marginalized communities and have extracted their labor. My paternal grandfather migrated with his family from Jalisco to a small town in Kansas where they worked as ferrocarrilleros or railroad workers as the only Mexican family in that town to this day. Uh, later, they would migrate traveling by train cars to California to become farm workers during the era of Cesar Chavez and the Chicano movement. My grandfather would later marry my Anglo grandmother and at some point he would cut ties to Spanish and he would sever a tongue I would never hear him speak. And my Nana, the most Nuevo Mexicana ancestor I have, never learned in her life that her paternal grandmother was an adopted Navajo girl, someone who's, who, whose history I may never know. This is my inheritance. So I chose the text and materials that comprise my book because I saw myself or someone with whom I was familiar in them. Each of the texts producing a more visceral response each time. In the beginning, it was a raised eyebrow that eventually grew to feelings of outrage at the ways in which our communities, our state, our nation, our global spaces hold on to harmful legacies tethered to colonial practices. I've been thinking about this book for a long time, at least 15 years. And for a long time, I only knew one way to respond. And that was the way I just felt about it. And during those 15 years, I've struggled to find the appropriate or even inappropriate responses uh, to ongoing acts of colonial violence. I realize that each of you today aren't located physically in New Mexico. That is the beauty of the Zoom presentation. Uh, but I wanna spend the remainder of my time focusing on chapters one and two of my book. So The Sins of Our Father and Claiming Home and Heritage in which I discuss themes of monuments and memory that are current topics of conversation but which are underpinned by many historical and social complexities. So when I was in my MA program at the University of New Mexico, I read Cleofas Jaramillo's Romance of a Little Village Girl for the first time and in another class in the same semester for the second time. Though I had lived in Puaque for eight years growing up, the fiestas and the idea of elite Hispanos was not something I was familiar with. I later came to understand there was a big divide between rich and poor Hispanos in Northern New Mexico. And it was oddly tied to which families worked for the Los Alamos National Labs and which ones didn't. This now surprises me thinking about how the nuclear industrial complex, much like the copper mining industry, is an exploitative and extractive system that ultimately does not serve our people. Though some Hispanos look at a job on the hill 
as an important socioeconomic distinction. At least it was that way when I was a kid. I can think back to my childhood in Puake and recall each time a fellow Hispano made fun of my family for wearing hand-me-down clothes or for not having proper curtains for the windows. The bus drove up the road to a rancho, passing by trailer parks with larger homes right across the dirt road, veering to the left to drop my siblings and I off at the single wide trailer, an upgrade from the camping trailer that we had lived in prior to that, before moving toward the Black Mesa and over to San Difonso Pueblo. In 2008, I moved from New Mexico for the first time to complete a PhD in Spanish cultural studies at Arizona State University. In my application for the program, I submitted an essay titled Representaciones de la Conquista en el Suroeste, Representations of Conquest in the Southwest. Not a very imaginative title, I know, but I had barely scratched the surface at that time of what would become a multi-year endeavor to critically understand colonization, its legacies, and the power structures that enable it to continue to this very day. One of the first events I attended um, at ASU was a film screening for John J. Valadez and Cristina Ibarra's documentary, The Last Conquistador, which centers on the controversy surrounding the placement of the equestrian, AKA Juan de Oñate statue at the El Paso International Airport. I mentioned earlier that I lived in Puaque for a number of years, but I was born in Grants, New Mexico, an economically unstable town following the uranium boom of the 1950s, a place where indigenous and Hispanic communities continue to combat the devastating effects of the uranium industry. And just 20 miles west of Grants is Acoma Pueblo, the site of the battle between the Spanish that was ordered by Oñate himself in 1599. I watched this documentary with a curious familiarity to the debate about Oñate's legacy. I'm sure I had read pieces of Historia de la Nuevo México in my MA program, likely Canto 34, which narrates the massacre at Acoma Pueblo. And I didn't get too far into the documentary before I noticed those elite Hispanos again. The ones I came to know through Cleofas Jaramillo's autobiography and who I would later meet at a Hispanic Cultural Preservation League award ceremony. It was there that I observed for the first time an embodied performance of Oñate pageantry. I was dumbfounded. But the documentary I watched as a graduate student in 2008 didn't just cause me to raise my eyebrows in curiosity and confusion felt really angry that the filmmakers chose this group to serve as a representative Hispanics from New Mexico. These were families who traced their roots back to the Oñate expedition or the De Vargas expedition and who conveniently overlooked the atrocities that their Spanish ancestors committed against indigenous peoples. And they continued to use the same kind of colonial rhetoric that their forefathers used so many centuries ago. Jaramillo's autobiography utilizes the same forefather approach. She begins her autobiography by utilizing a Spanish ballad to frame her family history within the larger trajectory of Spanish male conquest. Beginning in, 19, in 1492, she writes about, quote, wise Columbus, intrepid Cortez, Coronado, and Oñate, and brave de Vargas, a, quote, final reconquest of the hostile Indian tribes. You will all recall a similar sentiment etched onto the obelisk in the Santa Fe Plaza, a Civil War era memorial that honors heroes who battled savage Indians. There are nearly 100 years that separate the words of that memorial from the words Jaramillo used, and 53 years that separate her words from those of the Hispanic Cultural Preservation League, um, particularly Conchita Lucero in the documentary, The Last Conquistador, but the sentiment remains the same. Of the equestrian statue, Lucero states that, quote, it will finally be an unveiling of our history. We have a legacy, I think, to be extremely proud of. In the documentary, other members of the group argue that Oñate was a hero, that the indigenous peoples are an ungrateful group and that they need to get over it. But what I wanna point out here is that between 1955, when Jaramillo wrote about the adventurous spirit of her conquering forefathers and 2008, when Ducero used the same colonizing tone to praise Oñate, who many see as a Spanish father of New Mexico, we had a civil rights movement, a Chicano movement, an American Indian movement, what would be the start of a Black Lives Matter movement, where people who did not identify as elite Hispanos were fighting adamantly for recognition, for equality, for fair housing, 
and against discriminatory policies that threatened working class communities and treated them like second class citizens or even worse. This is something I discuss in greater detail in chapter three of my book, which of course I won't have time to talk about today. But so let's get back, um, let's go back a little bit and think about the kaleidoscope for a moment. And remember that it's not a static object, though these quotes might lead us to think that there are static ideologies. Uh, let's think back to what I mentioned earlier about the durability of colonialism and how despite the world shifting around us, we may be ideologically opposed or resistant to those shifts. And of course, the larger argument of my book is that there are various political urgencies that provide the subtext for these kaleidoscopic ruptures. Colonial relationships are unstable. They can only function if each group accepts their position. When there is resistance to the status quo, it upends the relationship, even if temporarily. These moments accumulate. The film uh, La Frontera by John Jotarianos documents a string of indigenous rebellions to Spanish conquest starting in the 1500s, demonstrating that resistance to colonial imposition was immediate. In 1599, Acoma resisted the Spanish. In 1680, the Pueblos drove the Spanish out of present day New Mexico. This is what happened when people began to see and know what kind of person Oñate really was, that the historical record of his mistreatment of his own settlers and of indigenous peoples resulted in his exile from New Mexico. And in Santa Fe, communities resisted the colonial narrative of the Entrada, which marked the moment when Diego de Vargas reconquered Santa Fe. However, the legacy of that moment forever is ingrained in our minds and in the minds of indigenous and Chicana and Chicano communities. Commemoration cer ceremonies are replete with colonial overtones, an homage to la conquistadora, a colonial era Marian figure who was renamed in 1992 as a reconciliatory act, serves as one of the, its most recognizable participants. As I show in my book, 1992 not only coincides with the renaming of La Conquistadora as Our Lady of Peace, but it also coincides with the 300th anniversary of De Vargas's entrance into Santa Fe, and it's a nod to the 500th anniversary of Columbus's arrival to the New World. La Conquistadora's name was changed to Our Lady of Peace that year, though 25 years later, she still denoted as La Conquistadora on the Santa Fe official website. Uh, these anniversary celebrations are more common than we might be aware of. And in my book, I trace the moments in which Oñata's historical and literary narrative is tethered to these colonial um, anniversaries and celebrations. And so I won't have time to look at all of these, but I'll just leave it up on the screen for a moment if you want to uh, take a look at that. So by now, and certainly living in Santa Fe in northern New Mexico, many of you are well aware of the controversy surrounding the Oñate statues, the Española fiestas, and the Santa Fe fiestas. We have seen significant shifts, certainly in the last few years, with the unanimous decision of the Española City Council in 2018 to withdraw city support from the annual Española Valley Fiesta, which included a commemoration of Oñate, this was accompanied uh, shortly thereafter by calls to abolish the Entrada in Santa Fe, an homage to the Vargas and La Conquistadora, or Our Lady of Peace. For many Nuevo Mexicanos, including Teofas Jaramillo, Oñate and de Vargas were pivotal to their cultural heritage. To a certain extent, celebrating the legacies of these colonizers allows some Nuevo Mexicanos to feel as they too played a part in ushering Spanish culture into their communities, and they see themselves as part of that legacy. And this is where I mentioned that con one of the quotes that Conchita Lucero has in the uh, documentary, the, the Last Conquistador, is who hasn't benefited from what the Spanish have brought, right? And so that, that typically serves as sort of a, justi a justification, a means to an end kind of argument when it comes to uh, colonization. So cultural celebrations in the form of statues, bodies of literature, and embodied performances expose deep socio-political and historical wounds concerning the perceived benefits of colonization. And they are at the epicenters of debates in a state like New Mexico, which is home to multiple heritages and cultural backgrounds. In Sarah Bronwyn Horton's 2000 study of La Jornada statue placed near the Albuquerque Museum in the 1990s, one of which was recently removed, she states, quote, all in all, ceremonies seem to suggest not merely a reencuentro or reencounter of Spaniards and Hispanos, but a return, a reinvigoration of Spanishness that aim to collapse the gap between conquistador past and a less glorious present. In chapters one and two of my book, 
I look carefully at the gaps between past and present, adding historical, literary, and cultural complexity to the notion that we want to imagine a present much like our past. And I challenge this by exposing the contradictions and ruptures within the colonial kaleidoscope. One that can reckon with race, gender, class, and other intersectional concerns, but cannot within a framework of the colonial coloniality of power, rid itself of the desire to maintain those structures, a system within the colonial mindset that refuses to surrender. As a female writer in the early 20th century, Jaramillo voiced her resistance to hegemonic power in various ways while well, she simultaneously celebrated and justified the sins of her fathers. Her activism and formation of the first folklore society in New Mexico, La Sociedad Folklorica, was predicated on her desire to replicate in the present a fading conquistador past. Her autobiography upholds this system, and while indigenous people are present within the narrative, the goals of preserving what Jaramillo saw as innately Spanish culture occupied a primary prism within the discourse and thereby ignored discourses of violent Spanish colonial practices. The colonial legacies that abound in the Southwestern US borderlands necessitate urgent discussions about what we hold important to the narratives of our communities and to our nation. Numerous markers of homogenous dominant history can be seen and felt throughout the US in the form of statues, of monuments, buildings, and other modes of production that seek to privilege one history over another. We remain troubled by the legacies of that colonial past, one that we can't really forget. We're reminded that power and violence is always present within the kaleidoscope as an ongoing legacy of colonialism, and the hauntings of that violence are not easily evaded. When I started this work so many years ago, uh, I began to listen and to grapple with the colonial legacies that identify Chicanos and Chicanos as both colonizer and colonized, not at different moments, but in simultaneous currents. I thought about what it would feel like to physically smash a mirror in front of myself and to look at the scattered pieces on the floor that represented my complacency and my resistance. While I do not claim to have found a solution to the questions that guided my research, I hope that at the very least, I have offered readers a pathway by which to approach the broken and jaded fragments of our colonial past and imperfect present. Beyond words inscribed on paper, beyond monuments that celebrate false heroes, we must be vigilant. And above all, we cannot remain static. And that is the end. So I will stop my share. And I will turn it back over to um, Elena. Thank you so much, Dr. Fonseca. Um, that was a wonderful presentation. And I do have uh, a few questions. I'd like to ask you at this time, I'd like to invite uh, audience members to submit their questions through the Q&A box or the chat box. Um, we can ask your questions before I ask mine, if you'd like, or I can start. Uh, anybody? Okay. Um, so at one point during the presentation, you said um, that there is no real answer to the question of what our legacy is. Is that correct? Did I yes. hear that properly? Um, and that got me thinking about what legacy means, um, kind of what it's attached to, right? A sense of pride usually. Um, and I'm wondering because so many of the traditions or monuments we feel strongly about are about pride, essentially showing one's pride in the past. Um, is there a way that we can remember the past um, and have pride without kind of holding on to those violent legacies? Or is pride always attached to violence in these cases? I think in the in these particular cases, it's always pride. Pride is attached to to violence, right? So Oñate essentially was defending himself and his nephew when he ordered the battle at Acoma. So he was fighting for his pride and his family's pride. 
um, you know, in, in the larger book conversation, I talk about these, these odd parallels between the sculptor John Hauser and his legacy and that of Onyate's because there's a, there's a point in the documentary where Hauser says, I imagine my vision was similar to that of Onyate and then I just kind of lost it and I was like, oh my gosh. So I started looking into it more and, um, you know, Hauser, Hauser's father was second in command to the sculptor at Mount Rushmore and that sculptor was highly racist. He was a KKK member and Hauser, you know, sort of defends it by saying that you know, he may have made these decisions to reach a particular end, right? And that really parallels a lot of Monyata's narrative. And so, um, and we know that, you know, the whole slew of Spanish conquistadores were here to find particular things, which they didn't find. And so a lot of it was trying to recoup a sort of recoup, um, recoup their identity and to ensure an inheritance for their children. Um, so to make their fathers proud and to pass something on to their sons, right? And so that just seemed to be like a common thread. Uh, what was interesting for me was when I, uh, when I read Forgetting the Alamore Blood Memory, uh, the main character, Micaela Campos, starts with acknowledging that she is avenging her father's death. It's a very sort of like Mulanish scene where her father is killed, she cuts her hair, she goes on this journey to avenge her father. But what she comes to find out is that her blood memory is attached to her Comanche grandmother. And so it's one of the first instances where you see that this lineage is a maternal lineage and not like the sort of patriarchal and paternal lineage that Jaramillo is clouding, that Jovita de Gonzalez clouded in many ways and Onyate as well. Um, so maybe there's something about humility and um, I wanna say feminism, right? Uh, kind of the matriarchal ways that can bring some sort of healing. Yeah, and I think that we've seen that um, more recently. I think that indigenous women in New Mexico um, have been at the forefront of a lot of these movements. And I think that um, they don't often get the credit that they deserve for the work that they've been doing. I think that, um, you know, there's a lot, there's also a lot to say about Jaramillo in those terms. And I know that you've written about Jaramillo before and others have, but to also think about her narrative isn't one dimensional either, right? There are things that in your own work you've come to respect and acknowledge that she did, right? She was one of the first pre-Chicana writers to imagine a space for writing for women. So if, we're, if it weren't for her, I don't know what the Chicana writers of today, you know, would look, who they would look to for that sort of like historical trajectory. So, um, you know, her narrative is also very complicated and that's why I always come back to it because there's always a different line or a different prism that can be explored in terms of her legacy. Right, thank you. Um, so we have quite a few questions. Um, here's one from Ines. One observation, Rico Hispanos are also present on the other side of the mountain in Las Vegas, New Mexico, where almost no one worked at Los Alamos. And um, her question is, how do we move past this obsession to a future? Yeah, I'm so <laughs> it's a good question, Inez, because I don't, you know, I was only speaking to sort of my experiences of growing up in Santa Fe, but then also recognizing that these same sort of the Hispano show up in Albuquerque. Um, I'm not actually familiar with uh, what the sort of trajectory is of, of Rico Hispanos in Las Vegas, so I'd love to talk to you about it sometime, but yeah, not something I'm super familiar with. Uh, from Constantino, how do you think the Pueblo Revolt of 1680 continues to be part of the New Mexican identity? Um, it's interesting to think about, um, you know, we think about that as a very pivotal moment of resistance. And I think that, you know, we can always, you know, there are shirts and there are sayings that all, it's remember 1680. And when one of the Onyate statues was um, vandalized at one point, that was, you know, what people inscribed onto the statue. And so I think we have to remember that resistance is always possible. And Albert Memmi in his work, The Colonizer and the Colonized, always talks about this in terms of individual resistance is not nearly as strong as collective resistance. And so one, you know, the Pueblo revolt was a big example of that, right? The collective Pueblo communities that came together to resist Spanish domination. Individual Pueblos may have not had as much success, but collectively the Pueblos were able to, for 12 years, um, you know, drive the Spanish out. And I think it's, it's a pivotal moment when people start to think about like, 
what is my history of resistance and what is my community's history of resistance? And to draw in many ways upon that power to think about what can be done today. A question from Priscilla. Um, fantastic, thank you. This work offers such a great example of how knowledge expands uh, with adding diversity to academia. My question, what do we learn from Chicanex culture for how to reckon with colonial legacies? Do you have a specific strategy that comes to the forefront from your research writing uh, teaching? And she added, when I say colonial legacy, I guess I mean colonial violence. Yeah, so I think that um, living, living in Arizona has made me much more attuned to the types of colonial violence that happen within the Sonoran Desert. For example, the Tucson sector in Arizona is the largest stretch of, of border land um, in the US. And so when I think about, or in the, the Southwestern United States, um, but when I think about uh, projects like the Migrant Quilt Project or um, various organizations that are humanitarian based and who um, actively provide aid to uh, undocumented immigrants crossing the border, not because like they think that they're acting in opposition to the law, but because we're human beings and we want to help people. Um, and then also thinking about just the long history of people who cross the border who remain unidentified. So the Migrant Quilt Project, for example, which I talk about in my book is, um, it's a quilt project, right? So everybody everybody who, who quilts can be involved in this sort of social justice effort, but the intention is to document the crossings in each calendar year and to go out into the desert to collect belongings from the deceased individuals who cross the borderlands and to quilt those into, or to sew those into a larger quilt to essentially honor the individuals that have crossed. Now, what is startling about that is that the majority, they try to document every name that comes through, but the majority of those people are listed as desconocidos or people, un, people that are unknown. And so when we think about violence to people whose identities will never be recovered, right? That, you know, to even look at the quilt is a startling reminder of just how like effed up the whole, this whole system is, right? To think about, the many families that will never be able to locate their, their fathers, their husbands, their daughters, their wives, their sisters, because they're only listed in the records as desconocido. Thank you. Um, another question from the audience uh, from Maria. I'm of Puerto Rican descent and now find myself as a SFPS educator tasked with teaching a Hispanic studies course to sixth grade students. My main objective is to help those students explore and embrace their unique identities. What books, documentaries, or resources would you recommend for students at such a tender and pivotal age? Ooh, um, well, I would recommend reading Dr. Valdez's article on the Santa Fe Fiestas, where she, it's in Chiriku Journal, but she talks about the, um, the how the Santa Fe Fiestas went into the public school system to really promote it and how that became a very problematic practice, especially for people who didn't identify with the overall ideology of the Spanish Fiestas. So I'll let Dr. Valdez uh, pass that on to you, but I'm also happy to be in contact with you over email to provide some resources for you. I don't teach K through 12, so I think in many ways um, what I want to teach people is much more um, is much more difficult, I guess, to to uh, of a pill to swallow um, than it might be. I might, and I'd have to rethink sort of a strategy for for what is appropriate for sixth graders. But I know that you know when I was a kid, um, we built pueblo homes in fourth grade, and I would never suggest doing that now. Um, in California, the schools have moved away from building sort of mission style, you know, churches to other strategies that give a sort of more nuanced version of California's history that wasn't predicated on Spanish uh, enforced labor of native populations. I, I want to add thank you for the shout out, but um, too, I think your work teaches us that um, so much of the material that exists, it's uh, difficult to talk about, uh, to think about critically, to acknowledge uh, what has happened to different groups of people and kind of what we've inherited uh, from what has been done. Um, but at the same time, I think there is uh, a lot of opportunity to discuss with students um, 
how how to make sense of those issues right yeah and we always encourage things like you know talk to your grandparents talk to your parents um there are plenty of learning opportunities that can come directly from your home and so you know maybe even with k-12 through schools like start with what kids know about what's around them i remember being in puaca elementary school in third grade and we made this little booklet it was called asias nuevo mexico we talked about fishing and you know we we leaned on our bilingual abilities which for me were pretty terrible when i was in third grade but you know, the, sort of those things I remember fondly as a way to sort of build my cultural heritage and pride without having to negate other people's identities that live in my communities. There's so much out there, so much to learn. Yes. Um, moving on, uh, Leticia says, thank you so much, Prof uh, Professor Fonseca for researching and writing this book. I really appreciate how you center your family story and the endeavor to how you describe situate and sit with being both the colonized and the colonizer. I wanted to ask a question about methodology, particularly as someone who is struggling with developing my research in Chicana picture book artists and writers and Chicana librarians. How might we think of this kaleidoscope intersectionality that brings together geography, racialization, and capitalism, ongoing settler colonialisms, and collectivities wrought in struggle? If we, in conversation with Chicanex studies, how might we use your kaleidoscope methodology across disciplines? And she says she's in library studies. Uh, thank you, Leticia, uh, for uh, fellow Marxista. Um, so I, I actually adopted it from Emma Perez, who is a historian. And so I think that even though I'm in literature, I think that we can look to lots of other disciplines for ways to um, to think about how we can move forward. Um, you know, I draw on critical race theory a lot to think about lived experiences. I draw on education a lot to think about the value of testimonio as uh, a methodological approach to, uh, you know, to lived experiences of Latinas and Latinos. Um, so really, uh, I would say it didn't come to me right away that this kaleidoscope was a good idea. And in fact, some people told me it was not a good idea. <laughs> and so, but I, um, I grabbed the, the quotes from Emma Perez really spoke to me. And then I thought, as I thought more carefully about those quotes, um, I thought, what can I, how can I intervene in this conversation? What can I add to what Emma Perez has already described? Um, when I sat, I shared my book proposal with Genaro Padilla and he says, you know, I would really like to know in your book just how a kaleidoscope functions. And so again, I spent a lot of time, I bought this kaleidoscope here and I sat and I, I, I messed with it a little bit. I looked up, you know, how, how they're supposed to function. So I really thought about sort of the mechanical elements as well and how this particular, my particular way of thinking fit into these mechanical elements. So it was a lot of sort of trial and error to get there and a lot of good conversations with excellent people who helped me to, um, to really point out that it was a good methodolo metho methodological thread to use in a book project. It's not something I had in my dissertation. Thank you, Dr. Fonseca. Um, Janina writes, would you say it's true that the majority of the US population is a combination of the colonized and colonizer if we more deeply examine our personal histories. How might what you've learned about your own personal history inform or encourage others to dig more deeply? Yeah, I mean, it always, when I thought about um, my grandmother's family, she grew up in Gallup, New Mexico, and I knew Gallup, New Mexico as a group of, you know, Hispanic people that I visited every time I went to Gallup. Um, we went to, um, you know, we went to ceremonies for uh, Navajo Nation. My grandmother was actually a seamstress for um, the what at one point was the president of the Navajo Nation for his wife. But she would say things at home like, no seas India. And when I was a kid, I didn't really understand what that meant, right? But of course, thinking back, it, it made me take pause. And I kept thinking, I was like, why would why would someone who works for the Navajo Nation, for, for the wife of the president of the Navajo Nation, you know, be at home saying things like this, right? And maybe we all have racist grandmothers or maybe we don't, but you know, I'm also thinking about like, what was, what was her context, right? And I had a conversation more recently with one of her sisters where um, 
I presented her the census record that their grandmother was an adopted Navajo girl. Um, that's not the story they heard growing up. They heard um, they were called Mokes when they were growing up, um, which alluded to what they thought was Hopi ancestry. And so it's just really interesting to come back and find the documents that prove something contrary to what we had always been led to believe, right? And so even when I, I sat there and I showed her the documents and she's like, well, that's not what we were told when we were kids, right? So, and I think about that when we have conversations about like Onyate and, you know, all these things where, you know, I spent the summer with Esteban Rael Galvez uh, compiling this uh, bibliography of Onyate sources that if anybody wanted to learn more, um, that this document would be at their disposal to do so, um, that they could go to the library, to the Santa Fe Public Library, <laughs> and they could, they could read the books that would help them gain a better understanding, but that that resource was already provided for them. But it doesn't necessarily change minds, because I think that the power of the stories that you hear from your family, um, you know, that they have a tremendous impact on the way that we ultimately think about the world around us. So in some cases, no amount of historical research, no amount of literature will change the minds of people who have been ingrained to think in a particular way. Thank and you. that's unfortunate. So. Um, I, from Ray, this year during the rise of the Black Lives Matter movement, we watched a national conversation about destroying or rehoming monuments and statues of Confederate leaders and changing place names that commemorate slave owners. Do you think we are on the cusp of doing something similar with statues of those like Onyate? Uh, yeah, so we, that's, what, that's what's happening right now. So um, in a conversation I had with KJAZ, which is a local NPR station, I had mentioned that, you know, it, it was always, in the back of my head, like what was happening in the American Southwest when the Civil War was happening, because all we learned about when I was growing up was the Civil War. And I thought that was a whole other side of the United States, like what the heck was happening over here? Um, and it turns out there was a lot happening over here. Um, the, the toppling of the obelisk, of course, as a Civil War era monument um, that links to sort of these, uh, these ideas of the Confederacy and the Union um, are important to think about because New Mexico did have a role in the larger civil right, or Civil War rather. And we don't often realize that when we're growing up. Um, right now, Ray, uh, two statues were toppled in of Oñate in New Mexico, one in Alcalde and one um, was toppled in Albuquerque, taken down in Alcalde. The obelisk was toppled more recently, and there have been various uh, conversations about changing the names of Oneata High School, for example, to you know something else. So well, this movement is taking place, and I think it'll just be really interesting to see like how far the momentum will carry us. Because again, like the larger argument that I make in this book is that this is not the first time we've had this conversation. We had it as early as you know 1895. And we've been having it ever since. And so what I really appreciate about this moment though, is that something happened. It wasn't just a conversation, some like a physical action happened to remove a statue that we've been talking about for too long. But we can't forget also that there were various groups in the nineties who were protesting these statues. There were indigenous people from Acoma Pueblo who were protesting the Oñate statue at the El Paso International Airport. Like these moments of resistance are always key to remember when we're thinking about where we are right now. Thank you. Um, I think we have time for one more question or so if anybody else has one. Um, from Adrian, how do we begin to support and create dibler De deliberate pathways for a new generation of philosophers, writers, and poets to give voice to a true and evolved narrative. I want to hear our new voice. Yeah, so I want to put in a plug for um, the Querencia anthology. Um, so uh, I co-edited with Levi Romero and Spencer Herrera um, an anthology titled Querencia Reflections on the New Mexico Homeland. And the intention of that book was to bring a new generation of Nuevo Mexicano scholars to discuss topics that maybe have already been discussed in New Mexico, but to bring a new perspective to them. So I encourage you to read that. Um, and actually, I'm, I'm happy to even if Santa Fe Public Library wants to uh, raffle off a couple copies, I'm happy to provide you with a couple copies to do that. Um, I did see that it was listed as a, a good Christmas gift in Albuquerque Journal. And so uh, I do think that having you know, having people like Dr. Valdez, you know, like the other scholars in New Mexico who are taking these really sort of 
these older texts and looking at them in new ways, I think is really insightful. And to have to keep having these conversations, even with new generations of Nuevo Mexicano scholars that are up and coming. Thank you. Uh, what a wonderful talk. I mean, I think I could spend a whole other hour having this kind of discussion. I don't know about everyone else, um, but I wanna thank uh, Dr. Fonseca Chavez for joining us today and discussing her book. And I wanna thank uh, our interpreter, Vanessa Martinez too. And of course the Santa Fe Public Library and the Friends of the uh, Santa Fe Public Library. It was my pleasure to be here with you all today. Thank you. Thank you everyone.